Hey friends, it's Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this episode, we are joined once again by our friend Brock Hollett. Uh, Brock is the author of the book Debunking Preterism. Uh, We had him on a few months ago when the book first came out, and I hope that all of you grabbed a copy. Uh, If you didn't, this is, again, this is sort of one of these essential books that you have to have in your library. Um, The clarity and the beauty of the gospel, in my opinion, rests in yearning and longing for the return of Jesus. You know, you've got these references, uh, it says, grace and peace, you know, and to to all of those who yearn for his appearing. Uh, The return of Jesus is the blessed hope. I mean, this is the focal point of all biblical hope, and yet we have many in the church today who are uh, teaching various forms of preterism. Uh, Preterism essentially is the the doctrine or the belief that so many, if not all of the the major biblical prophecies in the book of Revelation, in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, etc., 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 were all fulfilled or largely fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem. So this, in so many ways, it really undermines biblical hope, and it undermines a lot of things. It undermines Christian uh, expectancy, it undermines Christian preparation to face the coming dictator, and, and you know, we could go on and on and on. But in any case, uh, Brock has written a fantastic book, Debunking Preterism, and so he's with us again. Brock, thanks so much for being back. Yes, thank you, Joel. Good to be here. All right. So um, in this episode, what we're going to do is actually jump in to discuss this issue. I mean, this is just, you know, foundational, critical issue, which is the coming of the Son of Man, the return of Jesus. So real real briefly, uh, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus spoke about the coming of the Son of Man. In fact, the most consistently used term that Jesus refers to himself as is the Son of Man. So he's speaking about the coming of the Son of Man. He's talking about himself, the coming or the return, as we usually say, of the Son of Man. And historically, the church has always taught, I mean, in the creeds, I mean, consistently down through history. I mean, even at times when the church was really wrong on a lot of issues, the church has always historically taught that the coming of the Son of Man refers to the glorious return of Jesus, the second coming or the second advent. Um, But again, in more recent times, you have sort of this, um, I would say it's still fairly small, relatively speaking, but it's growing. I mean, it's um, like gangrene, it's spreading. Um, You have this this doctrine of preterism that actually has begun to question the very meaning uh, of Jesus' words. So Brock, we're going to jump in and talk about this issue of the coming of the Son of Man. So go ahead and sort of just take it from where I left off and just help the audience to understand what we're dealing with here. Okay. So preterists, you know, those who believe that, the, that these things happened in the first century, including the coming of the Son of Man, they see the coming of the Son of Man, by and large, we're talking about partial preterists, right? They see the coming of the Son of Man as referring primarily to the ascension of Jesus. And that seems counterintuitive in, in many regards. Certainly when you first read the text, it's sort of like, well, how do they get that? Well, you know, they they will look at Daniel chapter 7, where the prophet Daniel sees this vision of one like a son of man who is uh, approaching the Ancient of Days, which is another name for God, and is brought before him or into his presence at some point. And he's given a kingdom. And that kingdom, of course, consists of all tribes, languages, tongues, and people, so forth. And we know, of course, that Jesus, when he ascended on high, he sat down at the right hand of God. We see that in all the, you know, the early creeds of the Christian church. From where he now reigns and rules triumphantly, 
and from whence he is then going to return uh, to set up his kingdom on the earth. That's been the historic uh, position of the church. We see the early church fathers were um, across the boards uh, predominantly premillennial, so they believe that, that this time um, is of the kingdom reign, but that, that Jesus was coming back to set up his kingdom literally on the earth to sit on David's throne. And so the preterists, they'll take Daniel 7, where they see the coming of the Son of Man, and they say, look, uh, the coming there, uh, the word erkomai is the word coming in uh, both Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, and in the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man. So they'll say that word erkomai can mean coming or going, which is, grammatically, that's correct. And they say, see, this is talking about the ascension of Jesus coming up to the Ancient of Days, not recognizing, of course, the mystery of this inner Advent period where Jesus would go and sit at the Father's right hand and then come with the clouds later. So there's definitely a subsequent coming, and they're unable to sort of sort through that. So what they do, then they impose this idea of the ascension of Jesus on the text of, of the Olivet Discourse and on Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, where it talks about, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and so forth. And they say, See, that's talking about the ascension. And therefore, since Jesus, in the context of the Olivet Discourse, is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, therefore, they believe that in the destruction of the Second Temple in AD 70, there is a recognition or an awareness or every eye seeing in a metaphorical sense uh, that Jesus had indeed gone to, had ascended to be with the Father and now sits at his right hand. So they basically erase the return of Jesus from the text altogether and impose this meaning onto it. Okay, so let me sort of, um, let me uh, mirror this back. Um, partial preterists, and this is important because a lot of our listeners are probably, I mean, some are probably quite familiar and others are not at all. Partial preterists are not full preterists. They're not what we could say consistent preterists, or sometimes we say hyper preterists. We're going to get to that. Um, partial preterists, um, we could call it mitigated preterism. You know, they're they're trying not to go all the way into heresy, um, but yet they're trying to say that the majority of these prophecies have been fulfilled. So um, they believe, again, as Brock just said, based on Daniel 7, you have this passage of the Son of Man being presented to the Ancient of Days. They see that as Jesus' ascension, him going up. So instead of him coming down, coming back, they see, when Jesus talks about the coming of the Son of Man, they see that as his going up and sitting down at the right hand of the Father, and then, and this is really amazing, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD as the fulfillment of what we, uh, Orthodox historical believers, would see as the return of Jesus. They say, no, all of the passages, or at least most of the passages that traditionalists would look to, referring to the return of Jesus, they would say, no, that actually was fulfilled, as you said, metaphorically, in the destruction of Jerusalem, in an event in Jewish history that is oftentimes referred to as the first Holocaust. Of course, the Romans came in under Titus, and there were about a million and a half Jews that were killed during that time. I always just like to frame this. I go, guys, think about this. The book from the beginning has contained the record of God's promises to his people, the Jewish people, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it promised them an eventual deliverance, a time when no longer would they be oppressed by the Gentiles, by the heathen. And despite the fact that all of this language clearly uses references to a deliverance from the heathen, it is in the event when the heathen destroy them and crush them that all of those promises are actually fulfilled. That's perverted. That's evil. That's like saying all Jewish expectation was fulfilled in the Holocaust. It's hard, it's hard to underscore how, how re really evil that is and what that communicates to Jesus' brethren, the Jewish people. But this is, again, embraced by a wide spectrum of, of you know, again, even many Christians that um, are respect, respectable, excellent teachers otherwise, but they've sort of been pulled into this. So there is sort of the first issue. Go ahead and, and uh, take it from there. Yeah, that's right. And that's one of the dangers of this, this viewpoint. And, you know, ironically, uh, you know, they say, well, it's not talking about in, in Daniel 7, the return of Jesus with the clouds. Uh, 
But then what they've done by creating this, this other coming of Jesus, they basically have created many comings of the Son of Man. For example, in Futurism, in historic Christianity, we teach that Jesus, there are two comings of the Messiah. There's the first advent when he came upon the earth and during his earthly ministry. He ascended on high and then he's going to come back. So there is a second coming, if you will. Whereas with partial preterists, they've, they've actually, by doing this, they've created many comings. For example, they have the first advent. But then they say the ascension of Jesus is a coming of Jesus, or a going of Jesus, if you will. They have to actually uh, change the, the traditional interpretation of that word. And then they say, like N.T. Wright, for example, says that, that Jesus came in a spiritual sense to rule in Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And then you have the coming of the Son of Man in the Roman destruction of the Jews in A.D. 70, where they say every eye saw him in a metaphorical sense or uh, realization, but certainly not an optical visualization. And then they believe in the return of Jesus as another coming. So they actually have up to five comings and, and some would even posit some more. So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, N.T. Wright, we're dealing with a man who many people say is the leading New Testament scholar of our time. And uh, it was interesting. Um, I saw an article, I don't remember, where he was sort of mocking the idea. He's, he, he very dogmatically stated that there is no Jew in the first century who would understand, uh, and he referred to the return of Jesus. He said, there is absolutely no Jew in the first century who would understand this phrase, the coming of the Son of Man, to refer to some man descending from heaven like some kind of astronaut or something like this. I'm paraphrasing it from memory, but he really was sort of mocking the historical traditional position that Jesus is coming back in the clouds. And of course, it states it very clearly in the beginning of Acts where he ascends and there's this angel, it says a man, he's sitting there and he says, men of Galilee, why are you sitting there staring at the sky? He says, this Jesus that went up is coming back in exactly the same way that he just went up. So I thought, how in the world does N.T. Wright uh, address this? I mean, it's so clear. And so I bought his um, little... Uh, every man's commentary on the book of Acts, because I said, I have to see how, how Wright gets around this. And um, not surprisingly, do you know how he got around it? Well, I'm not exactly sure. He does call it a primitive form of space travel, which is ironic space because, travel. yeah, in the process of that, he sort of, uh, he takes away from the very idea that Jesus is, like you said, in Acts 1, verses 9 through 11, he's coming back in the same manner that they saw him leave, so... Yeah, so what he does is he actually skips that verse. He has a commentary on Acts, and he literally just skips it. And I was like, I want my money back. You know, I, I bought this commentary for this one verse to see what his position was, and he just skips it. Because how can you deal with, with a verse that is so crystal clear? I mean, it's just, it's bizarre. And, and, and to use mockery in the process, that's what I just, I don't understand. Right. Absolutely. It is very shocking. And sometimes you get that with these, with the preterist scholars. You just, you'll have some good scholarship and then all of a sudden, kabam, it's like, wait a minute, what? You know, that's yeah, one yeah. of them. So um, moving on, um, I'm looking at some of the notes that you've laid out. You've got 10 reasons that the coming of the Son of Man in the Olivet Discourse must refer to the return of Jesus Christ. Right. So in working on my book, Debunking Preterism, it as I was writing this chapter on the coming of the Son of Man, it became very crystal clear that there are, there are some very deliberate uh, reasons and clear reasons, um, most of them, for believing that the coming of the Son of Man is not some allegorical or spiritual event, but rather the, the physical return of Jesus. The first, the first reason that I, that I have there, and I spell all these out in chapter 7 of my book, is that the Apostle John he uses Daniel 7, verse 13, which we alluded to earlier, and Zechariah 12, 10, so two prophecies. He conflates those two verses, both in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, as did Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 30, when he presented the coming of the Son of Man. What's interesting about this in Revelation, very specifically, in the immediate context, he connects that coming as a future, he calls it, a, he considers it a future event. For example, he says, he calls Jesus the one who is to come in the very next verse. He, uh, Jesus says, I will come. I will come to you soon until I come. I will come like a thief. I will come. I am coming soon. Behold, I am coming. All of those references, most of which come from Jesus' own lips as recorded by the Apostle John, is a future event. So by the time John was penning these words, he couldn't have been talking about something that happened at the ascension of Jesus. He's clearly talking about a future coming. 
Yeah, and this is important. So there's a term sometimes that commentators, uh, interpreters use, which is intertextuality. So as we are trying to understand the apostolic interpretation of various texts, rather than our opinion of these texts, we can look at the other passages that, for instance, John the Apostle links, um, as you said, Daniel 7, 13, 2. So he links it to Zechariah 12, 10. Behold, you know, he comes, behold, how does it read exactly? All the tribes of the earth will see him, even those who pierced him. So again, this is a passage that traditionally futurists understand as the return of Jesus coming in the sky, all the tribes on the ground see him. And, um, and then there you have in Revelation 1 verse 8, John actually links those two together. He links Daniel 7 with Zechariah 12, essentially saying these two passages are speaking of the same event. So this is, you can see in the intertextuality, in the, um, you can see the apostolic hermeneutic, and of course this, this conflicts with the traditional preterist interpretation, because they would say, no, those are two completely different events, or they would sort of find some way to sort of break them up into essentially disagree with the Apostle John. That's right. That's right. And so that brings us to our second point, which is this idea of the cloud coming of God or of Yahweh in the Old Testament. We call that a theophany. That's just a fancy word that means the glory cloud of God and, and, and God being present in the glory cloud like he was in the tabernacle in the wilderness during the time of Moses. So these theophanies th throughout the entire scripture, the entirety of scripture always refers to, to Yahweh coming from heaven to earth. There's not, a, there's not an exception to that, except when they see the cloud lift up, of course. And so each time, it's a literal visible cloud in the Old Testament. When you read the Exodus narrative and you go through and you see all the way back from the parting of the Red Sea, all the way to certainly at Mount Sinai and at the tabernacle, and uh, even, even when Solomon prays later on at the dedication of the temple, it's always a visible cloud that's seen optically and visually by the people. And so um, that would be the second point, is that we're dealing with, if we're dealing with a literal cloud, then the coming of Jesus with the clouds and using that theophany language of the Old Testament, it would make sense that that too would be visible. Yeah, and I've been parked in Exodus pretty much the whole past uh, year or so. And uh, one of the things that's really just struck me is how clearly all of the language of the theophany at Sinai is really where it started, you know, Exodus 19, Moses, uh, go and consecrate the people because on the third day I'm coming down. I'm coming down on the mountain. And tell them, not man or animal, don't let either step foot on the mountain. If they do, they are to be stoned to death or shot through with arrows. And, uh, you know, God came down in clouds, in fire, in smoke, in earthquakes, in trumpets. But all of that imagery is then utilized with regard to the return of Jesus. So the God that came down in the cloud, in fire, with a great earthquake, with trumpets, is coming back on the clouds with the trumpets, and a mighty earthquake will shake the whole earth. And it's amazing that the correlation between the return of Jesus and uh, the, the Sinai theophany. So yeah, he, he wasn't going up, he was definitely coming down. That's right. And your your new book, I'll put in a plug for you. You weren't expecting this, Joel, but your new book on Sinai actually delves into some of the theophanies, I believe. So um, yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Yep. Yep. So uh, <laughs> stay tuned. Um, yep. So the third point is that Jesus's literal return is demanded by the Old Testament allusions that are found in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. So, for example, um, and this is important in Daniel 7, 13, where it talks about the coming of the Son of Man. It's interesting because this isn't a just a Christian idea. It goes all the way back to the to the Second Temple period within Judaism, as recorded. Um, of course, it was recorded in Sanhedrin in the Talmud ninety eight a, but but uh, it, it has a it has a pre Christian tradition. But the idea is that uh, this was always seen as the literal arrival of the Messiah. When you read Sanhedrin ninety eight, it talks about the coming of Messiah on. Um, on the donkey, and it talks about his coming with the clouds. It's clearly literal in the context there. So if 
Judaism, as many times that they do, they try to have uh, traditional Judaism. Judaism has tried to depart from its its you know the the idea of Christianity. So, if anything, they would try to get away from the idea of connecting Jesus as the Messiah. But in reality, here they continue to hold to the tradition that the the coming of the Messiah on the clouds is actual and literal, and visual for that matter. Um, in Zechariah chapter twelve, verse ten where uh, both Jesus and um, Revelation 1-7, where it connects the coming of the Son of Man there. Um, this passage is quoted elsewhere in the New Testament, and each time it's referring to people visually looking at the Lord's flesh and, and bone pierced body. Okay, so if you go back and you look at the prophecy in Zechariah, it talks about, they will look upon me, speaking, and this is the Lord speaking, they will look upon me, Yahweh, the one that they have pierced, right? And this is day of the Lord language, the things that will happen in the future. And when John chapter 19, verse 37 uses that, it's with reference to people look visually looking at Jesus on the cross. And in John chapter 20, verses 25 and 29, it's, it says once again, this passage in Zechariah is fulfilled in, in doubting Thomas, visually seeing the risen Lord after he had showed him his hands and his feet. So clearly connecting, visually looking upon the pierced and risen Lord is the idea in all of those in all of those texts. Another thing too is in that passage in Zechariah, uh, the context clearly shows that God will destroy the nations that surround and attack Jerusalem, and that Judah, Judah and Jerusalem will be saved. They will be delivered from these and ultimately delivered from these enemies. And yet we see the complete opposite in AD seventy. We see. Uh, like you mentioned before, we see people, uh, there was mass uh, holocaust, mass murder, and of course exile and slavery. So certainly there was not a de deliverance, certainly nothing in the immediate future that could be construed as a deliverance of Israel. Right. Also this idea of all the tribes of the earth that you mentioned earlier, Joel, is a technical phrase in the Old Testament which refers to peoples or nations of the world. It's not restricted to the directly to the 12 tribes. Although it, although it can be used there, but when it's used in the Old Testament, when it's used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's referring to uh, peoples or nations of the world. And finally, all or nearly all the men who are directly responsible for actually killing Jesus, um, that, you know, preterists will say, look, they looked upon him whom they have pierced in A.D. 70, right, when they recognized that, Jerusalem, that Jesus was Lord in the destruction of Jerusalem, that somehow in those events they recognized that Jesus was who he says he was. But yet you got to realize that even those who pierced him, if it's talking about, the, you know, the Sanhedrin or Caiaphas or those that actually had Jesus murdered, um, they were long dead. There were, there were, I think it'd be fair to say that they probably, none of them were living by A.D. 70. So certainly they didn't see Jesus. So we must be talking about um, either a post-mortem, you know, that they would see in the afterlife, Jesus, um, or something like that. But certainly not that it was a mere recognition in the events of AD 70. Yeah, it's important for people to realize that, um, you know, in the first century, not to overly simplify things, but you had this sort of framework um, for understanding the scriptures, and this is called Second Temple Jewish Apocalypticism. It generally believed all of these things would be fulfilled, literally, as modern-day Christian futurists do. Um, but you had the influence of the the Greek sort of Hellenizers, and um, and so early on, many of the Christians were trying to allegorize, spiritualize, or see these things as metaphors or you know whatnot. And, you know, it by literally taking the narrative of, you know, again, all the prophecies pointing to Israel's deliverance, their ultimate yearning for the Messiah, the final Savior to come, and com not, not, just, not just distorting it, but to completely invert it, to completely flip it on its head to where it is actually the destruction of Israel, destruction of Jerusalem by the pagans, by the heathen, to say that is the fulfillment of all of those things. It's not surprising, and, and to utilize this sort of Hellenistic spiritualization, really this sort of pagan merging of a, a pagan influence with, with biblical interpretation, it's no surprise that Paul said, pay no attention to this vain babble. You know, repeatedly, he just calls it vain babble. And, you know, he actually says, like, have nothing to do with these people. 
Um, you know, he, it's almost borderline. He's saying they're not even believers anymore. And I'm not saying that every partial preterist is not a believer, but it's interesting to see that Paul, in referring to this, um, you know, he, he uses some pretty strong language. This is not just sort of a, well, my, my Christian friend's a preterist and it's no big deal. It really is grievous to the Lord and it's destructive to the essence of the gospel. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, although not all, uh, not all air is, is damnable, not all heresy is damnable. It's certainly all damaging and it's costly. It's very costly. Uh, right. the, for, the fourth reason why the coming of the Son of Man must be the, the return of Jesus is because in the New Testament, when the cloud coming of Jesus is spoken of in other places, it's very clearly his literal and visible return. You mentioned earlier Acts chapter 1. Uh, that, that's a passage where clearly Jesus' return is in view. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. There we see Jesus coming with the clouds, in the clouds, on the clouds. This language, over and over, is with reference to his return. And of course, this is admitted by partial preterists. And the latter two passages is actually speaking of uh, the time of the resurrection as well. So he's not only connecting it with the return of Jesus, but with the resurrection of the dead as well, which is a corrective for some of the other errant views of, of eschatology. Five. Number five, preterists are misusing Old Testament passages to argue for non-literal cloud comings. So you will have preterists say, look, we know that the cloud coming language of the Old Testament is figurative, that it is allegorically, that it is allegorical or, or something along these lines. But, but many times when they quote those passages, they don't realize that many of them are literal. For example, many of the passages, um, well, the, the passages they quote break down into a couple different categories. Some of the passages they quote from the Old Testament where those theophanies are in view are, de, are describing not theophanies at all, but actually the, cloud, the literal clouds of darkness that will accompany the day of the Lord. Okay, Some of the other passages they quote are, are clearly in the genre of poetry. They're clearly figurative language, of course, but they recast the Exodus narrative, which, which we talked about earlier, is very literal and it's describing a visible cloud in the desert in Sinai, okay? And then the third category of passages they'll quote from the Old Testament, Theophanies, uh, actually describe the day of the Lord, but it's decidedly future, as we have seen, it's visible and literal. And so they assume that these are talking about past day of the, you know, day of the Lord type uh, events, for example, the destruction of kingdoms in the Old Testament and so forth, but it's a massive assumption and, and, and it's detrimental. Rather, the day of the Lord is a future event. It's, it's associated in the New Testament with the day of Christ Jesus, his return, the time of the resurrection, the redemption, and so forth. And in those past, when the Old Testament prophets use the language of the day of the Lord, they're, they're employing something from the future and using the events of their time uh, in such a way to connect it with that future event not saying that the day of the Lord was past or that it was happening in their time per se. And that's very important, and it's, a, it's really a, um, it's a paradigm shift, but it's important that we get that, and it's important that we see that in the context. It's, um, it's amazing how disjointed um, their sort of uh, interpretation ends up becoming. Now, you know, to be clear, there are many what we'll call interim days of the Lord. You know, there are various judgment events down throughout history which are um, prefigurements of the ultimate day of the Lord. You know, oftentimes, just as a basic sort of interpretive uh, hermeneutic principle, you can say the prophets are often speaking to events that are in their near or relatively near future. They're prophesying to the people of their day or in just ahead of them. They're warning, they're speaking of impending judgments and different things like that, However, they are speaking through those things, ultimately pointing to the ultimate day of the Lord. And so preterists will say, well, see, you have this sort of this interim day of the Lord. There's many days of the Lord. You know, there's no such thing as the day of the Lord. There's many of them. And we can go, yeah, certainly there's many interim day of the Lord. However, there is only one ultimate day of the Lord. This is sort of the omega point of expectation of the entire Bible. It, the, the, the biblical worldview divides everything down. You look at the language of Jesus between this age and the age to come. He doesn't talk about, you know, now and then we die and go to heaven. No, it's this age and the age to come, and that is divided by the day of the Lord. And if we miss the centrality 
the importance within the the story of redemption of the day of the Lord, then really you just end up with just sort of this big jumbled mess where where there's an incredible lack of connection between any of the prophets. They're not really um, they're not really commenting on each other. They're sort of just randomly making comments that are disconnected. And it's to me, it's just actually a really confused sort of perspective. Yeah, that's good. I think it's important. Uh, number six is that in Matthew 24, 31, when Jesus speaks of his coming, the coming of the Son of Man, he connects the trumpet sound or the blast of the trumpet and the angelic gathering of the elect with his coming. Now, futurists teach that this, these, this angelic gathering actually is talking about literal angels who will gather the righteous dead and the living at the rapture and resurrection. That's the historic position of the church. Preterists, however, teach that this refers to the worldwide preaching of the gospel through messengers or human, uh, human um, angels, if you will, or messengers. And so they actually prefer, many of them, to translate the word uh, there as messenger instead of angel. Now, grammatically, you can translate the word messenger if it's warranted by the context. But again, context has to reign supreme, and, the, and this text was not created in a vacuum. So... There's a problem, though, with, there are many problems with that, but the one I really want to point out is what's called an anachronism, and that's the idea that where you take an event and you place it in the wrong period of time, okay? And here's what I mean by that. We know from Matthew 24, 14, that the worldwide preaching of the gospel must occur before the end of the age, before the coming of the Son of Man and so forth. Jesus is very clear about that. But we can't say, like the, like the preterists have to argue, that the gospel went to all the nations before A.D. 70, right, in order for that to happen, and while the, that's while the destruction of Jerusalem, um, before the destruction of the Jeru Jerusalem, and that this destruction of Jerusalem also signaled that very event. In other words, that the gospel went forth to all the nations after that. So they, they want to have, have it both ways, and it, and it just can't be. Does that make sense, Joel? Yeah, so essentially they say that the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was the consummation of the end of the age, or would they say it's the beginning of the end of the age? Um, they would say that it's, the, many of them would say it's the consummation of the end of the Jewish age, yes. The, the, the end, end of the, the Jewish, Jewish age, age. Right. in which case they would say that the, the Great Commission, the gospel was proclaimed to all nations before 70 AD. Right, and necessarily so according to the words of Jesus, right? Because he said the gospel has to go to all the nations and then the end will come. So if they put the end will come in AD 70, they had to have the gospel going to all the nations before that. But then, then they also have, we also have to say that that's the very event that signaled, in other words, the destruction in AD 70 signaled the gospel going to all the nations according to the words of Jesus. So, so it's, uh, it's difficult to hold to both. Okay, number seven. Okay, number seven. And I have a table in my book on this particular thing. But there are common elements. There are five common elements that we see regarding the coming of the Son of Man that we see in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse. And also in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. Two passages that very clearly, and partial preterists admit this, are regarding the return of Jesus and the resurrection of the righteous dead. And those five events are that Jesus Christ would appear in or from heaven with the clouds, accompanied by angels, accompanied by a trumpet blast, and accompanied by the gathering of the elect. Now, in the latter two passages, in Paul's uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, clearly the gathering of the elect is referring to the resurrection and the rapture. And there's no question about that. It's certainly the partial preterists would at least admit that it's dealing with the resurrection of the righteous. And so um, you, can actually, you can actually see not only are these events found in the, both the Olivet Discourse and in Paul's writings there, but, all, but in the exact same order as well. In fact, there's some linguistic markers that actually show that Paul was drawing from the Olivet Discourse when he was, pre, when he was uh, teaching both the Corinthian and the Thessalonian saints. Yeah, and there's just another example of intertextuality. You see Paul clearly drawing from passages that we all agree are speaking of the last days. Um, and But if you're a preterist, you're forced to sort of, you know, interpret each of these in isolation and, and sort of disconnect them. No, this is talking about 70 AD, 
Yo, this other passage may be speaking about the ultimate return of Jesus, and it's sort of disconnected. And you go, but Paul didn't allow us to do that. Paul clearly connected these things, and so on and so forth. I mean, the, you, could come, you could probably find 10 different examples. Paul was actually talking about the, um, the man of lawlessness, and he's referring back to Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, you know, and they would say, well, that was, you know, they'll have all sorts of different opinions about who, well, that was Herod, or that was Antiochus, or that was some Roman, you know, and, and, and nobody can really agree. It's just, it's disconnected, and, and again, Paul doesn't allow us to do that. It's pretty clear that he saw these things as all pointing to one singular story. Yeah, that's right. I mean, partial preterism, it requires at least two distinct last trumpets, which signal two distinct comings of Jesus on two distinct judgment days, at two distinct times of the end, which result in two distinct gatherings of God's elect, two distinct arrivals of God's kingdom, and two distinct dissolutions of two distinct heavens and earth. So this double vision, and I write all this, this is a quote from my book, this double vision transforms the power and plainness of biblical eschatology into a maze of confusion. It distinctly stinks. Yeah, it really does. And it takes the idea of intercontextuality or intertextuality that you mentioned earlier, and it basically says that, that uh, you know, it, it, it tears it in pieces, really. Right, right. Yeah, that's good. Number eight. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 13, verses 39 through 43, gave us a parable about the angelic end-time gathering of the elect. And clearly there, the origin of the angels is heavenly not earthly. In this parable, Jesus quotes Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, regarding the resurrection of the dead, which, by the way, is also connected with the time of unprecedented tribulation, as does Jesus when he connects that in the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24, 31 then alludes to the coming of the Son of Man in Daniel 7, where angels are clearly heavenly beings. Remember we talked earlier about how the angels would be accompany Jesus or perhaps pre present Jesus before the Ancient of Days. Clearly there, we're talking about heavenly beings. We're not talking about earthly messengers heralding the gospel. We're talking about angels from heaven. And of course, we can look at Revelation 4 and 5, and we can see those angels accompanying Jesus at his ascension, right, prior to yep. his return. Isaiah's little apocalypse. That's yes, number nine. Isaiah's little apocalypse, which is in Isaiah chapters 24 through 27, connects the timing of the, the, the tribulation period, the day of the Lord, at the end of the tribulation, the great trumpet blast, the Lord's arrival, the resurrection of the dead, and the gathering of Israel's elect. Once again, we have another witness there in the Old Testament this time that connects all those same events. Clearly, we're dealing with the time of the Lord's return. And finally, number 10, the historic church has always, at least until modern preterism, taught that the coming of the Son of Man in the Olivet Discourse was the glorious return of Jesus. If you go back and you look at the Fathers, you look at the Reformers, they all taught that the coming of the Son of Man in this passage and in Revelation was the return of Jesus. So preterism has brought in a new monkey wrench that has, essentially takes the day of the Lord and puts it in the past. Remember, that's the very thing that the Apostle Paul warned against uh, when he was talking to the Thessalonians and warned them that the day of the Lord cannot happen until certain events take place which we would argue clearly has not happened in the events of AD 70. You know, this is a, a big uh, bone of contention with the preterists. They'll say, well, we hold to Scripture. We're not really concerned with the creeds. We're not concerned with the historic creeds of the Church. And as Protestants, we say, absolutely, sola scriptura. We believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority. However, in the Bible, Jesus told his disciples, he said, listen, I'm leaving, and I'm going to send another and he's going to guide you into all truth. And so even Protestants, you know, even radical reformers, we believe Jesus. We believe that he sent the Holy Spirit, and he guided these faulty, uh, fallible men to uh, pray and seek the Holy Spirit, to, you know, pray about and, and actually determine what would be the very canon of Scripture, and to determine what would be some of these historic, essential creeds of the, of the Christian faith. It's not to say the church hasn't stumbled along the way, but to say that they completely flummoxed the central focal point of expectation of the entire Bible, that when it comes to the blessed hope, they completely had that wrong and confused, and we've only just now, 2,000 years later, figured it out, um, that's a pretty radical position to hold. And yet, you know, again, there's a spectrum among preterists, 
but there are many that actually would essentially hold to and, and agree with what I just said, that it's not until recent years that we finally have kind of figured it out, that the Christians have just been completely wrong for the past 2,000 years. That's right. Um, well, Brock, fantastic. Thank you so much for this. We're going to have you on again, and we're going to continue the conversation and um, sort of touch on some other very important issues. But for now, um, this is all the time that we have for this episode. I want to thank you all so much for being with us. Until next time, I'm Joel Richardson. This is Brock Hollett, and this is The Underground.